Okay guys, so we have hit the end of the book. It is the end of Milkweed. Um, so this is going to be the last set of sections. If you remember, um, in the last section, Yuri um, shoots Misha as he is trying to look for um, Janina, who left to go to the trains to relocation. And um, he wakes up, he has no ear. Um, and so one of the things that we need to kind of talk about before we go on is why does Yuri choose to shoot him in the ear? And so, and, and why does Yuri shoot him to begin with? So obviously Yuri is working for the jackboots. Um, you know, and think about why he might do that. You know, life is so bad at this point that he has to figure out some way to stay alive. And so becoming a jackboot or working for them or whatever is probably the best way to do that. Um... And so when he finds Misha, I think he realizes that if Misha gets on that train and Misha leaves, he's not coming back and he is going to die. And so to try to save Misha's life, he shoots him, but shoots him so that he doesn't kill him. And so this, but it looks like he's dead. You know, he, he passes out on the street. So this way Misha still hopefully, you know, would have a chance to live um, and not end up in a concentration camp. So we left off, he woke up in a field, he is, um, you know, was passed out, woke up, and there's a man standing over him. The man placed his foot on my chest. You're a Jew, he said. Yes, I answered. I pointed to my armband. See? What are you doing here? I'm following the trains. Janina, I'm going to the ovens. What ovens? The ovens for the Jews. I'm a filthy son of Abraham. They forgot me. Can you take me to the ovens? The man spit in the weeds. I don't know what you're talking about. You make no sense. Are you insane? That word was new to me. I don't know, but I'm stupid and tiny and fast. He jerked me to my feet. Tiny is right. He tore the armband away. What happened to your ear? Yuri did it. He tried to kill me, but he missed. Come with me, he said. I took a step and fell back into the ground. When I awoke, I was bouncing in a cart pulled by a donkey. When it stopped, the man slung me over his shoulder and dumped me into a heap of hay in the barn. The farmer's wife came and gave me water and a carrot to eat. With water and rags, she cleaned my wounded ear. Then she tied a rag around my head that covered the ear and one eye. Do you know Yuri, I said. She tied another rag around my crusty arm. Did you see Janina? She touched my forehead. You're burning and you stink. The farmer's wife put me in the wooden tub and scrubbed me until I screamed. She brought me clothes. She burned my old ones with the shoe in the pocket. The wife came every day and cleaned my ear and my arm and felt my forehead and gave me water and carrots and boiled turnips. I slept in the hay and played with the mice in the barn. One was my favorite. I shared my turnips with it. I called it Janina. I tried to run up my arm and stand on my head. Then a cat ate it. One day I awoke and the ringing was gone. I walked out of the barn and through the fields until I came to the tracks. A spot of white caught my eye. The armband. Set, snagged on a thorn bush. I stuffed it into my pocket. I had been walking the tracks for a long time when the farmer stopped me. Where are you going? He said. To the ovens. The farmer knocked me down with a spot of his hand, and I was back in the donkey cart with a rope around my neck. I was tied to a stable post in the barn. I remember Yuri's story of my beginnings, of becoming a slave to farmers. Maybe the story wasn't made up after all. Maybe I was catching up with my life. After some days, the farmer's wife came to the barn and said, You must not run away. There is a new law. All children must work on the farms. Then to the ovens, I said. Yes, she said. Then. I slept in the barn, ate in the barn, worked in the barn. When I wasn't working in the barn, I worked in the fields. I hauled rocks to the donkey cart. I picked bugs from the vegetables when I wasn't picking them for myself. I learned to milk the cow. One day, the cow kicked me. I told it I told it what had happened to the cow in the ghetto. The farmer's wife, her name was Elzbieta, fed me, fed me with the pigs. The pig's toilet was my toilet. Every night, I was tied to the stable post. Sometimes in the night, on the far side of the field, I heard the huffing of locomotives and the clack of the iron wheels. Many times, I asked Elzbieta, the wife, when will the law be over? When can I go to the ovens? Soon, she said, but you must not run away. If you do, the Nazis will burn down the farm and feed us to the pigs. So I worked and waited and talked with the donkey and the mice. Then one day, a man came in, a horse and cart, and said something to the farmer and went away. Later, I heard the farmer shouting in the house. Then I was awakened by the, a voice, the wife, run. The rope was around my ankle. The rope around my ankle was gone. There was something under my shirt against my skin. Bread. I ran. The war was over. I had been on the farm for three years. I was, I was back walking the tracks. This time I had company. 
Thousands of them were trudging the tracks, the roads, the fields. No jackboots guarded them. They were carnivals, markets. They sprang up in fields along the railroad and were gone by the next day. People sold things. Shoes, cigarette lighter, apples. Anything for money, anything for food. I saw a tent made from bed sheets. A man was calling, come in, come in, see Herr Hitler, come right in, only 50 Zlotties. I didn't even have one Zlotty. I waited until someone was paying and slid under the bed sheet. Lying on the ground was a skeleton. Its bony feet had been stuffed into long black boots. A steel helmet swallowed half the grinning skull. Another man called, ten Zlotties, you won't believe your eyes. There was no tent, only a handkerchief. A customer paid. The man stood in my way so I could not see. He lifted the handkerchief and let it fall. The customer wanted his money back. While the two fought on the ground, I lifted the handkerchief. It was something I had never seen. Something Ferdy said did not exist. Something Mr. Milgram had said was like happy. It was an orange. The hucksters fascinated me the most. I stood in front of them for hours as they ranted to the passing parades about the wonders under their tents and handkerchiefs. They never stopped. They never ran out of words. When I laid down in weeds or a barn at night, I whispered into the dark, come and look, you won't believe your eyes. I dreamed of bodiless jackboots tramping the earth. I dreamed of burning cows. I dreamed the stone angel looked down on me and said, I am nobody. I walked the tracks and roads. I offered my services to farmers for food and a bed of straw in the barn. When there was no work, I took my food from wherever I could find it. I drank my water from bomb craters. I rode on trains. So did many others. I rode on boxcars and cinder cars and tankers. I rode a thousand trains. None ever took me to Janina or to a candy mountain. Somewhere along the way, I heard the story of Hansel and Gretel, and I knew that the end was not true, that the witch did not die in the oven. One day, I found myself back in the city of Warsaw. The bomb craters were gone. There were still rubble. Trucks and carts were hauling it away. I thought I heard a machine gun. I ducked into a doorway. It was a jackhammer. I saw people slumped in alleyways, but they were not covered in newspapers. They were sleeping for real. I found the ghetto. The wall was gone. I walked right in. I looked for Niska Street. I could not find it. I could not find our house or the orphan's house or Oleg hanging or the rug we slept under. There was rubble and there was nothing. Even the flies were gone. On the trains, I had heard about the revolt. Until then, I thought I was the last one out of the ghetto. I did not know. 40,000 people were still there. The following spring, as I hauled the farmer's rocks, the Jews turned on the jackboots with stolen guns and bottle bombs. But the jackboots were too many with their tanks and flamethrowers, and the revolt was over by May, and the people were herded to the last of the trains, and the ghetto was no more. Standing in the silent dust, I understood at last what Yuri had done, and what he had saved me from. I understood that the Yuri I knew, the real Yuri, was not the one the Nazis knew. I smiled to think of him on that last day, once again in his own clothes, shaking his fist at the oncoming tanks, his red hair flaring, invisible no more, calling the world's attention to himself. After I walked out of the ghetto there was no that was no longer there, I wandered the streets of the city. I stole my food. One day, in a crowd on the sidewalk, I caught a whiff of mint. I stopped, looked about, ran back the other way. I stared into faces. I sniffed. There it was again, mint. A man's mouth was working, a fleck of green on his lips, a grisly bony man. White whiskers, sunken eyes, ragged clothes, bare feet so dirty I thought at first he wore socks or shoes. No club, no fat belly. I planted myself in front of him. He stopped. That man. His head didn't move. His eyes sagged down to me. I tugged on his rags. Fat man. His eyes were dead. Fat man, it's me, Misha, me and Janina, remember? Sorry, guys. Can't find the picture. He did not hear I shook him. Fat man, buffo, you hate me. You want to kill me? Here I am. Here. I took his hand and put it on my head. He, kill me. His hand slid off my head and flopped to his side. I punched him in his bony stomach. Fat man, look. I pulled my armband. I pulled from my pocket something I had been carrying all this time, the armband. Once blue and white, now mostly black. I rolled it up my sleeve. Look, fat man, I'm a Jew. You have to kill me. Look. But he would not look. He shuffled into me, almost knocking me down and shuffled away. I watched until he was lost in the crowd. I took off the armband and let it fall to the sidewalk. The world was returning to normal, but there was no normal to return to. But for me, there was no normal to return to. Normal for me was stolen bread and ditch water. Little by little, I learned about forks and money and toothpaste and toilets. Back in the countryside, I did what I did best. I stole. 
I snatched everything I could carry. I became my own donkey. I pulled a little cart everywhere I went, and whenever I stopped, I became a carnival. I was so good at stealing, people saw things in my cart that they found nowhere else, and I was cheap. What did I know of prices? By the end of the day, my pocket was only a little less empty than my wagon. But who cared, for I had discovered my voice. I became a huckster like the ones that had fascinated me. Oh, bread for sale, apples, shoes, cigarettes, ladies, undergarments. Come and see amazing bargains. For me, it was more about talking than about selling. There had been a few words, bur few word bursts during and before the ghetto, but up until the end of the war, I had probably not spoken 2,000 words in my life. Now, you could not shut me up. If my cart was empty, I kept on hawking just to hear myself talk. I wallowed in words. There was no end to them. They were free for the taking. No one ever chased me down a road yelling, Stop, thief! He stole my word. Time went by. I talked enough and stole enough and sold enough to buy a steamship ticket and join the multitudes going to America. The immigration officer said, what's your name? Misha Milgram, I said. What's a Misha? He said, your name is Jack. I became Jack Milgram. I learned English. I went on talking. In America, that means I was a salesman. No one hired me to sell the best products. The problems were my size. I had stopped growing at five feet, one inch. My accent and my missing ear which now looked like a clump of cauliflower. I couldn't blame them. Who would let such a galoot in the door? Good day, madam. Can I interest you in a nice vacuum cleaner? Forget it. Then I got my big break. I was hired to sell a miracle vegetable chopper on the boardwalk in Atlantic City, New Jersey. I was given a table and a pile of cucumbers. 10 o'clock in the morning. People were gathered in front of me. I began describing the wonders of the miracle chopper. Somebody called, what'd you do, chop your ear off? Before I was half through my spiel, the last person was walking away. I felt desperate. Wait, I called. My mouth took over. There's something I have to tell you. Dr. Korzak was right. There was a cow and it burned like a marshmallow. People stopped and turned. They were thinking, what's he talking about? What does that have to do with the miracle chopper? Who cared? As long as I was talking. Himmler looked like my Uncle Shepsel. My Uncle Shepsel looked like a chicken. You want to know what rat tastes like? Rat tastes like mouse. I'm going to warn you one last time. Do not take the horse from the merry-go-round. I told them everything except for Janina. All that I had seen, all that I was. The boardwalkers streamed by in both directions, stopped to listen, three or four. Miracle choppers sold, zero. I was fired by the end of the day, but I had found something. Next day, I was back on the boardwalk. No cucumbers, no choppers, just me standing near steel, steel pier spouting off. Then one day, I took the bus west of Philadelphia. To earn money for cheap beds and cheap places, I handed out circulars and swept gas stations and shucked oysters, but my real job was running my mouth. If you walked the streets of Philadelphia in those days, you probably heard me. 15th and Market, Broad and Chestnut. You heard me and you turned. And as soon as you realized I was spouting nonsense, you turned away and walked on, muttering to your friend another nutcase. And I was on a corner, it was on a corner that I met my wife. 13th and Market, a cold day in November. She stopped and listened. That was rare enough. Five minutes later, she was still there. That was unheard of. Then she left, but she came back with a bag of roasted chestnuts from a street vendor. She offered me one. Her name was Vivian. She came back every day, staying longer and longer, bringing me hot chestnuts. She lured me away from the street corner, lunch at Horn and Hardart, walks in Rittenhouse Square, card games in her ground floor apartment. Always I went on talking, telling my stories. Vivian became my street corner. Vivian was a normal, sensible person, but I think at that time she must have gone a little cuckoo. Maybe my words dazzled her. Maybe she saw me as a needy refugee from the war or an exotic artifact of history. In any case, one day out of the blue, she blurted, okay, I'll marry you. And I thought, did I ask? The marriage lasted five months. Vivian quickly found out that living with me was different from playing cards with me. When caroling children came at Christmas time, I slammed the door in their faces. When I saw a copy of Hansel and Gretel in the bookstore window, I went in and grabbed it and ripped it to shreds and Vivian had to pay for it. In the shower, I sometimes turned on the cold water, but could never stand in it until I became blue. I snatched apples from fruit stands. I did strange things at parades. I laughed in the wrong places. I heard flies. Remember Warsaw? What a feast. We were so full of crap we couldn't take off. I cried for no reason. In the night, the colossal black flame-throwing jackboots tramped through my jeans. Finally, Vivian had enough. As she was leaving, I stared at her stomach. Are you pregnant? I said. Goodbye, she said. She closed the door and I went to back to the street corners. Remember the day you were hurrying by with your briefcase or shopping bag, turning for the parking lot? The one-eared, pint-sized Looney Tune ranting at you? 
That was me, flapping day after day about Olek and Uri, Yuri and Himmler, the chicken, and Kuba the clown, and the crows and black pearls, and my yellow stone, and the food that flew over the wall, and the flaming flying cow, and the orphans marching and singing, and the man who scrubbed the sidewalk with his beard, and Buffo's belly, and Dr. Korzak's cozy goatee, and the ladies with white gloves and cameras, and Greta the horse that never was. They were all a jumble in my head. What a mess they must have been coming out of my mouth. And you? You were the thing that gave me shape. But I wasn't even listening, you see. I don't even remember you. Don't feel bad. The important thing was not that you listened, but that I talked. I can see that now. I was born into craziness. When the whole world turned crazy, I was ready for it. That's how I survived. And when the craziness was over, where did that leave me? On the street corner, that's where, running my mouth, spilling myself. And I needed you there. You were the bottle I poured myself into. I branched out. I went to nearby towns that I had never seen the street corner talker. Norristown, Corn... Horn Shakakin, Glenside. The years, the words went by. Then one day in Philadelphia, in the shadow of City Hall, two women stopped and listened. They looked to be in their 70s. They wore wide hats that shaded their faces like little parasols. After a while, one of them reached out her hand and cupped my ear clump. She smiled and nodded and said, We hear you. It's enough. It's over. And they walked on, and I went another way, and I never took to another street corner. When my daughter found me, I was stocking shelves in a bag-and-go market. Today. So now this would be like modern times. Poppy noodle, poppy noodle. My granddaughter screams from another room. I get up from my easy chair to go see what it is this time. Look at me. I'm looking. She is standing on her head, but the toes of her pink sneakers never leave the floor. And I am once again reminded of the girl whose name she carries. Janina. So he named his granddaughter Janina. Or you know, help, helps name his granddaughter, Janina. I was putting up soup cans in aisle four when I heard the voice behind me. Mr. Milgram? I turned. It was a woman in a light blue skirt and windbreaker, dark brown hair. She was holding the hand of a little girl. The little girl looked up at me with huge, unblinking eyes. Daddy, said the young woman. I stared. I'm Catherine. I'm your daughter. I've been looking for you forever. She shifted the little girl to stand in front of her. This is my daughter, Wendy, your granddaughter. I'm four, said the little girl. What happened to your ear? Wendy, said her mother. A distant voice that only I could hear replied. It was shot twice, first by a jackboot, then by Yuri. Did you know you're my grandfather? I still could not speak. Well, you are, she said. Shake. I held, she held it in her hand. I held out mine. She took it and gave it one hard shake. Pleased to meet you. I looked at her mother. You didn't know about me, did you, she said. I, wa I cleared my throat. I wasn't sure. Her smile was radiant. Well, I'm here. I'm 25 years old. I know about you from mother. For four years now, I've been saving something for you. I hesitated. Yes. Wendy's middle name. I left it blank. I knew someday I would find you. She's been wanting, waiting four years for a middle name. I want you to give it to her. Janina, I said. My daughter's laughing rang through the market. I thought you'd at least take a minute to think about it. She took up the little girl's face in her hand and turned it toward herself. She nodded. Wendy Janina, so it is. The little girl clapped. She twirled about. Wendy Janina, Wendy Janina. We live in Elkins Park, said Catherine. We have a spare bedroom. You can have your own bathroom. I dropped my apron in aisle four. They took me home. Wendy Janina tries to improve her headstand. She pushes off from her toes a little too hard, which sends her tiny body sailing past a headstand and into a back flop on the hard floor. I wince at the thump. From the floor, her eyes cast about until they find me. Her lower lip sticks out. She is deciding whether or not to cry. Secretly, I almost hope she does. I like to be the grandfather who stops her tears. I hold out my arms. She gets up and comes to me. I lift her to my lap. She puts her head on my chest. She doesn't cry, but it's enough. I would like to stay this way for a year or ten, but she leaps from my lap and pipes outside. She grabs my finger and pulls me out to the deck. I'll sit here, I say. I settle into the rocking chair. Watch me, she says, and runs to the swing set. I watch. She swings back and forth. The maple tree behind her is a brilliant orange. The year is gorgeous and it's dying. The milkweed pods are bursting. The milkweed does not change colors. The milkweed is as green as October as in July. When I said one day to my daughter Catherine, drive around out of town and brought along a trowel and a bucket, she did not ask why. I said, stop here and dug it up and she only said milkweed, right? I nodded. She did not object when I planted it at the end of the yard away from the maple. Angel plants must have sun. My daughter does not pester me with questions. She knows everything that I have told her mother, which means everything but Janina. All those years of talking, all those street corners, I kept my sister to myself. One time Catherine said to me, are you ever going to tell me why you named her Janina? 
Someday, I said. I last Wendy Janina tires of the swing, or maybe she just wants a ride on the rocker, me doing the work. She plops down on my lap, rock, Poppy Noodle. I rock, I smile, I close my eyes. I think of all the voices that have told me who I have been, the names I have, I have, I had, call me thief, call me stupid, call me gypsy, call me Jew, call me one-eared Jack. I don't care. Empty-handed victims once told me who I was. Then Yuri told me, then an armband, then an immigration officer. And now this little girl in my lap, this little girl whose call silences the tramping Jack boots. Her voice will be the last. I was, now I am, I am, Poppy Noodle.